All right, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing time so far. Our next panel is titled Banking, Risk Management, and AI. Please join me in welcoming our panelists to the virtual stage. And I'll hand it over to Natalia, our moderator. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at AI for 2021 Finance Track. My name is Natalia Bailey. I'm a policy advisor in the Digital Finance Department at the Institute of International Finance. Um, and I'm joined today by Agus Sujanto, Jacob Kosov, Ashish Jain, Amin Shristav, and Victor Gadban. Um, and I'll ask each of you to just do a quick introduction for our viewers. Maybe Ashish, you can start. Um, sure, happy to go first. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashish Jain. I lead, uh, I'm the Chief Product Officer at Arcos Labs. And Arcos is a fraud and abuse prevention platform. And, and I get to work with a number of e-commerce and gaming and, and banking uh, entities. And uh, uh, prior to joining Arcos, I led identity risk and uh, trust platforms for eBay, where my team is responsible for all global registration, authentication, account management, KYC, AML, consumer fraud, and, and a variety of other things. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel today. Thanks, Ashish. Agus, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you very much. Agus Sujianto. I'm the head of corporate model risk for Wells Fargo for the last eight years. I uh, have the responsibility to uh, oversee all the uh, model in production for Wells Fargo. Jacob, do you want to jump in? Uh, yes, um, my name is Jacob Kossoff. I'm the head of model risk management at Regions Bank, uh, located in the Southeast US. Uh, and I've been running that for seven years. And similar to a goose, we're responsible for all the uh, model governance, model validation, model ethics reviews for all the analytics models, uh, all the AI and all the related data science products. Great, Victor? Yeah, hi, super happy to be here. I'm Victor Gadman. I'm the Chief Field Data Scientist at Explorium. My role is to work with customers in understanding how the application of predictive analytics would work in their environment. I've been doing this for probably close to 21 years now, so it's been evolving a lot over the last couple of decades. Thanks, Victor. And Amit? Yeah, hi. Uh, glad to be part of this esteemed panel also. And uh, thanks for the opportunity. So currently I manage the model risk uh, team and internal audit at Morgan Stanley, where we cover uh, you know, controls and frameworks for model development, model validation and model governance, including machine learning, AI, privacy, and you know, all new upcoming concerns. Yeah, thank you for the great introductions. I think we have a lot of ground to cover today. Um, but we'll try to discuss some of the future trends in AI and machine learning as they relate to finance, um, the impact of regulation, the barriers of, for safe adoption, and also what is needed to overcome those. Um, so let's get started. Um, we, you were seeing the question on, on, the, on the slide there, but how has risk management evolved since the 2009 financial crisis? Um, now I'll ask Agus to go first. All right. Well, I probably will start with the narrow focus first, right? Instead of the broader risk management, I'll leave it to my fellow here to uh, talk about the broader risk management. On the model risk management side, things change dramatically, right? From what, 2009 to today. So uh, we are for regulated uh, institution like banking, we have SR 11.7, OCC 11-12, that we are celebrating the 10 years of those. That's uh, really transforming the way we manage uh, model risk from what we did before, very ad hoc and depend on the uh, institution. Today, we industry converts into uh, a lot of common practice across the board, make the use of model a lot more safer and uh, so when we have the, uh, another crisis, right, the big one that we just, uh, we're still in the middle of it, the uh, COVID-19, everybody are ready. They know how to manage model, manage model risk really, really well. 
Thanks, Agus. Um, Jacob, can I ask you to jump in? I saw you nodding when Agus was speaking. I would 100% agree with what Agus has said. Since 2009, I think the board and senior executives have developed a lot of skepticism around analytics, skepticism around models. They saw that a variety of their underwriting models failed, their capital markets models failed, market risk models failed, loss forecasting models failed. And we see that even through today at that um, our board and our senior leadership has healthy skepticism that they know models are, are uh, not always accurate. There's concerns on use, concerns on predictive power. And, you know, I'll say something a little controversial. I, I actually think our level of uh, rigor on model risk would more or less be the same, even if there was no regulation, uh, at least at my firm, like the leadership healthy and correctly has concerns that are these models predictive? Are they not? And while SR 11 seven was, set that great groundwork. I would say most of what's leading to our uh, good work we're doing and, and finding of errors has really been leadership's skepticism, not skepticism, but maybe recognition of the weaknesses, recognition of the limitations, recognition of the risks, recognitions of the, the, um, the, the, the real uh, pitfalls around analytics and, and models. And while there's a lot of lift from models and a lot of growth, and we've seen that since 2009 financial crisis, there's also a lot of mistakes and errors. And so I think that's just important that leadership has found both the benefits and the risks and the regulators uh, play a role. But ultimately, I think leadership and healthy risk management is really what's driving uh, good, high quality model risk management. Thanks, Jacob. Amid. Um, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, I think I would say there are two trends that are sort of prevalent since 2009. One is that I think the you know, board and senior management, uh, they have, um, the concern is more shifted towards the non-financial risks. So I think, well, 2008, 2006, 2008 crisis showed the risks of model risk, you know, market, credit markets, now the concern is more non-financial risks. And by that, what I refer to is, you know, risks of cyber uh, information security, uh, climate risk, conduct. Um, so in some sense, the evolution of risk has moved towards more of these new uh, sort of, you know, the, the risk perimeter right. is expanding in some sense. And I think sort of complementing that, the other trend is that board and senior management have become more comfortable, um, you know, like Jacob mentioned, uh, about the use of analytics. So the, there is more sort of rigor on analytics given the SR 11.7, but also I think there's more acceptance of using analytics in these, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the established areas as also an attempt to move it to these areas of non-financial risk. I think that's going to be the challenge in the next sort of, uh, in the next few years, how do we use analytics in these uh, areas which are non-financial risk, which have traditionally not been used, uh, not been heavy users of analytics. Thanks, Amit. And Ashid and Victor, you both have a different perspective. Um, can you jump in and also share your views? Yeah, I, I can start. So there's three different things that I can think of. So before 2009, this was right before, right around the time when big data started to become more prevalent to build your analytics. So most financial institutions were really focusing just on the data they had on hand. So the models weren't really that predictive. It was when you build a model during a normal period, everything seems okay. You can't really predict risk until you actually have risk involved. So the models typically all broke. Big data started to really evolve between 2009, 2019. Companies were able to get more data, store more data, access to more data. Things seemed to be okay, then COVID hit and all those models failed again. And the whole idea of risk is, is that things aren't normal. When risk happens, something is causing something, something bad or just something to change a normal trend. So again, things broke about a year and a half ago. And it's, again, you had all this data, but you needed more data. You needed access to really build those predictive models to really dig down and find something that you could just never predict. And COVID, of course, broke all that. And then now there's a lot more data from COVID that we can start adding in. So it's definitely evolving. We need bad events, um, those black swan events to really happen, cause something 
get the data, build the data, make your models better. So I think we're progressing, we're getting to a good trend right now. But even now, we'll probably be able to make better predictions, but we're going to have to wait for that next bad event again to really help evolve these models to keep going forward. But it's just keep growing that data set internally, externally, access to data to really build better models. So things definitely, it's, it's the progressive trend that we've been following for the last couple of decades. And I'll let Ashish um, add on. Yeah, thanks, Victor. I was gonna add, uh, I hope we do not wait for the next event to happen before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I hope uh, we have a little bit more proactive strategy to address it. But I think to kind of add to what, you know, many of you shared, right? If you do a retrospective, right, there were challenges in 2009 around governance. There were challenges around incentives. There were challenges around uh, internal controls. And there were challenges around infrastructure. And you know, we uh, get to work, uh, uh, spend a little bit more time with the infrastructure team. So I can tell you from that standpoint that we see a significant change in terms of the reliance of data reliance on analytics and reliance on overall digitization. And I think, uh, Jacob, you made a comment that how big data has evolved. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, uh, we did not have the, the storage capacity and the compute power. And not only we did not have so much data available to us, so that has changed. And hence the reliance of all of that is continued to evolve. Now, what that means is that when you have so much data that you have to manage, this also means that the governance of that data also need to be updated. So I know Jacob, you made a point that from a model standpoint, you would probably do the same thing with or without the governance, but I've experienced firsthand uh, you know, at eBay and even at many of the customers that we talk to that the management of the data, the policies of how do you exchange the data, the policies of how do you store and delete the data, especially when the data was siloed by different groups within the financial institution was non-existent. So as we make data more available for models, right. uh, there is certainly a lot more focus on how can we kind of build that governance layer so that the data does not end up into the wrong hands. The other part I think we see oh, is- Ashish, you guys, know, sure, absolutely. Guys, one point on that to agree with you is that I think on that data point, it's a great example where I think because of the concerns on data quality and data lineage and data usability, uh, that's not driven from regulators, at least from my experience, that's driven because we want to do more modeling. We have concerns about missing data. We have concerns about data integrity. We have concerns about data accuracy. We have concerns about data lineage because we want to build predictive models. And I would say, you know, the majority of, of that improvement on data governance and data policy, whether data is used for modeling or other purposes is due to it to real non-regulatory reasons. Would you agree? I would say that uh, I have seen the regulatory pressure. I know without okay. naming the client and the customer that right. uh, there was uh, an RFI issued uh, ah. in, in terms of how do you manage the data? How do you exchange the data? Especially when you're keeping the consumer data and you are sharing that data with third parties. Now, That's whether fair, that yeah. third party is a separate subsidiary within the banking uh, industry, or is a separate vendor where you get to you know, do some uh, outsource analysis. Ah. Uh, there is definitely, like, you know, we have seen the Facebook Cambridge uh, uh, scandal break out and that essentially resulted into a little bit more focus that how do you get to share the data? How do you apply policies? How do you delete the data? And, and my point is that models is, is at the top, but there is this underlying data infrastructure, which is equally important when we talk about AI. Right. That's One right. of the things that is important, it's not just a lot of data. I think today people made huge investments in just storing everything they can get their hands on, buying everything they can get, going to external vendors, but it's getting the relevant data, getting rid of all that noise that that's not relevant. Especially today, we're capturing everything, every purchase you make, every survey you fill in, everything you sign up for, every, you buy a cell phone, you buy a car, all that data is getting sold off. And there's and all your social media behavior is being tracked, everything you click online, every page you visit. So it's a lot of information, but it's choosing the right data. So people are building models, but they're not getting the relevant data, the focus on the risk management or fraud management. It's just throwing the whole kitchen sink at a model and hoping it works. So there is a need to focus and narrow down and get the relevant information needed to be able to make the best prediction possible. 
Yeah. Right. But remember that, right? The data that you mentioned, even if it is not valuable for the risk manager, there is ways to monetize that. That data for somebody else is actually gold. And I think, Amit, you made a point that how the focus has become more around operational and cybersecurity. So you know, spending the last you know, 15 years in that space, I can tell you, right? Like how much of that data is gold? Like I can then how accurately predict what you're gonna buy next, right? So we all agree that the amount of online interaction is increasing. More and more products and services are becoming online. And, and then that essentially means all of your behavior, all of your habits, all of your device fingerprinting, all of that data is being collected. And if it is being collected and not being properly managed in the wrong hands, that data and around from a cybersecurity standpoint, the yeah. surface area is increasing. I think right. that's the point I was trying to make around you know, data challenges. Yeah, but there's another facet mm -hmm. to this also in the sense as, the, as there are multiple sources of data and data becomes more available, it creates you know, what you know, we call the Frankenstein data problem, right? So as you're piecing together data from multiple sources, instead of you know, getting accurate or relevant data, you end up with a Frankenstein monster of a data, which is misconstrued, uh, mislabeled, uh, you know, and causing all sorts of uh, errors. And I was thinking about that, Victor, when you made the point about the pandemic and why you know, the models did not work. I mean, recently there was an article that came out which actually pointed to that very same point that a lot of the errors actually came from mislabeled data and data being pieced together from different sources, different hospitals. Yep. Yep. When the pandemic happened, there was no clean source of data. There was no where you could go to and say, this is the golden source of the data, right? So that itself, having multiple sources of data is itself causing you know, uh, another downstream impact. And Jacob mentioned yep. data lineage. Um, there's risk involved in getting the right data to even build a risk right. model. It's ensuring you trust the sources, that the data is accurate, that the data is something you can use. So just going onto a Google search and downloading the first file that comes away is obviously not, not the best way to build any predictive model, but it's getting that lineage, getting the trust involved, ensuring you're working with a vendor or a data provider that has all of their, all the regulations in place, everything that they're doing is correct, that they're not just grabbing random data and passing it off to you. Um, so definitely there's a lot of uh, factors involved in ensuring you're getting the right data to build. So as I mentioned earlier, it was relevant, but the relevancy covers the trust, the lineage. Sure, there's still not a golden source, but it's getting better today, but it's still obviously a million different places you can find the right data, but you can find definitely a lot of differences. I can search probably Jacob up in 20 different sources and get 20 different answers for the same question. So you definitely want to make None sure- None of it's true. None of it's true. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the issue Jacob. today, right? It's getting that right answer, which is the hard part. Yeah, and I think we've already sort of moved to our second question. So I'm going to go ahead and move to the second question that we have. Um, and that is, which challenges does AI present to risk management? And, and we've seen that, I want you to also think about what are the regulators' main concerns around the use of AI in finance? Because I think it's a very relevant topic. Um, so let's just start this time with Jacob. Great, great question. So I'll, I'll tell a story from March of 2020 we had. So our team, we were validating a traditional fraud transaction model. So the model's designed to see if someone's uh, transactions for their credit card and, and their debit card are fraudulent, right? If it's the genuine, uh, bar, the genuine uh, actor or it's a nefarious actor. And so the number one predictive variable for a fraud model at the time in most of the industry is card present to non-card present transactions. So if historically the customer has card present transactions and all of a sudden there's non-card present transactions online or other ways, uh, there's a higher probability that it's fraud and it's higher chance there's an alert that freezes your card or texts you or, or freezes it with the merchant or whatever it might be that the transaction is denied. Right, so, uh, a model, uh, so what does model risk do? So model risk says, wait a minute, let's use some common sense here. It's, it's March of 2020, we're doing this validation there's a pandemic. There's safer at home orders. There's stay at home orders. There's even in states without those orders, there's people that are not going out and about and customers are changing their behavior to do more online shopping. My mom, for the first time ever, bought shoes online in March of 2020. Uh, she's 79 years old. She had never done that. And 
So of course, when she did that online, her card was frozen, and she and the model thought uh, for this other firm was that it was a uh, it was fraud. However, what, where model risk, I think, to the point of the challenges of AI, is you really run into this issue of overfitting, whether it's credit models and a lot of famous examples of that over the last 18 months in the, in the financial services industry of overfitting of consumer credit models. But you see it also in financial crime. You see it in marketing. You see it in AML. And I think in fraud, we saw that that there was material overfitting and significant amount of weight on card present to card not present transactions. And these models stopped being predictive of fraud. And so model risk teams were able to buy national data, even if they're like, say, a Southeast Bank, which had a slower stay-at-home orders and slower quarantine, and, and they, uh, customers started tightening up their behavior, their physical trend, uh, outside behavior and mobility, you know, uh, later in the Southeast and other parts of the U.S. But you could buy national data or buy data from Washington State or New York State through the, the, the bureaus, and you can give feedback to your model owner. You need to reestimate the model because, and it's one of the challenges with AI, we need that we don't think it has the right conceptual soundness. This variable that was predictive during a past regime, during a past behavior, during a past world is not predictive anymore. And now I think for almost all industries or for all, all banks, uh, card present to non-card present uh, transaction is no longer the leading indicator for fraudulent uh, debit card or fraudulent credit cards. Uh, transactions. So I think that's an example of just that's really, uh, and there's millions of these examples, but I think this is one that really gives an example of a live challenge that AI models are presenting uh, over the last 18 months. And one of the things you mentioned is behavior, and that's something that has definitely changed over the last year and a half because of the pandemic. Um, it was easy before that to look at someone's FICO score, or credit score, and say, yeah, they're a great person to lend to, right. but after being shut in for a year and a half, after uncertainty about their employment, uncertainty about their family lives, uncertainty about when things might get back to normal, a lot of people's behavior has changed. And now there's a lot of risk involved in understanding that. And I think we're going to start seeing this unfold now. I mean, I would like to say we're post-pandemic, but it seems like things are wrapping back up. But eventually, we're going to have to start getting more information on how people were affected by this, behavior has been affected to really start understanding the future risk involved because just having good credit doesn't really mean much anymore when it comes down to how people have actually changed. So there's, right. the world has changed. Definitely. And I think if, yeah. if the, the, the challenges that you both kind of brought up, like I'll, I'll put them still into the category of, we know how to solve them. Like, you know, look, I think right. we discussed that, you know, the data tagging and the data labeling and the whole process of feature engineering, which is the quality of the data and of course, as the behaviors change, the pandemic changed uh, how we all operate, we're gonna have to continue to monitor and evolve and not just rely on the history. So I think there is a set of challenges just around that. But then if you even up level is, like this one I feel like is, is a matter of time. We just need to continue to tweak and learn and, and analyze. But then I feel like there's a set of challenges that we do not know, like, like how do I insert modeling into my decision-making process within the company? And what happens if there is conflict? You know, what happens if there is, uh, you know, reliability issues and it, you know, what's the fallback strategy? Like, you know, for instance, like I go to a new city, I, I, don't, I just have GPS and, and I feel completely fine. And I have outsourced in a way my decisioning to a GPS system. What happens if the GPS fail? Like I actually do not know how to react all of a sudden. And who takes, like, you know, what is our fallback strategy when these models do not uh, behave right away? Like, you know, there are issues around, you know, ethics and, and bias and trustworthiness and equality, right? You know, what happens if there is a, a, a Tesla gets into uh, an accident with a, a Chevy Bolt, who is responsible? Uh, how do we assess who, who has the final authority when two ML-based models contradict with each other? So I think there are, there are challenges like that which are even higher than the technical challenges that we discuss. Yeah, and maybe before I, I give the floor to Agus and Amit, um, so at the IIF, we have been looking at the use of machine learning by our member institutions, and we've done that through a series of surveys. Since 2017, we started serving our members. And we've looked at how they're using machine learning in credit risk and anti-money laundering and financial crime prevention, and also around the governance uh, framework for machine learning models. Um, and I'm a little bit surprised that I'm not hearing you talk about 
the challenges of supervisory consent to use new processes, which was actually the number one concern when we survey our members in 2019. And then the second one was around explainability as an issue. And, and I think Ashish, you mentioned earlier the, R, the US RFI, um, which heavily touch on that as well as fair lending. Um, so, um, and I say that to say, because we were surprised at the IF when we saw that the, that supervisory sentiment being the, the challenge that the majority of our members saw, and we had 66, 66 firms participate on that survey and it was a geographically diverse sample. It's not really US specific only, um, but explainability, I think it's something that perhaps we should try to touch on because I think it is very relevant. So I'm going to pause and open up for a goose and a meat in case either of you have any views on that. I, I, I can start, Amit, you want to start or me first? I mean, no, go ahead, Agus. Well, the biggest worry that I have, the biggest problem on the risk management is too many snake oil AI out there. <laughs> Too many yeah. people selling yeah. snake oil. Yeah? yeah. Be it the application, be it the uh, you call it everything AI. So because if yep. you slap AI, you can sell it. So that's one. And then the other snake oil on the uh, explainability. If people applying black box, applying gradient boosting machine, and apply SHAP or Lime, they think they have explainable model. That's another snake oil that we have to deal with. Uh, snake oil on the, uh, that we can debias the algorithm. We can apply something to debias uh, the decision making. That we have societal problem with the data, with the uh, things, and we think we can handle it by debiasing. So it's so many snake oil out there that we have to be very, very careful. This is a real problem. It has very, very significant impact. And we have to get through this one because unfortunately, a lot of people not very well trained. If I have open source, I have something that easy to use, I'm going to apply it. By applying all those techniques, it doesn't make the model less biased. It doesn't, go, yep. it doesn't solve the bias problem. It doesn't solve the explainability problem. There's too many things out there today where you can just drop data in and build a model and you think you're good to go without any reliance on understanding how it was built, why it was built, the data that was used was built, the algorithms it used. People put too much trust today into a black box model and think that's good enough. But then if something happens, how do you explain how you came up with that decision? That's where a lot of people start to fail and companies fail. So it is definitely yeah. a difficult situation today. Yeah, no, that, but this is uh, this is an education and awareness problem, right? Like I, I'm not like I'm not disagreeing with August when you said there's a lot of snake oil, but at the same time, like we are still very very early stages of ML and AI. Like we are replacing you know thousands of years of decision making and outsourcing that, and it will take us some time for us to get mature and and being able to to explain it and and being able to continue to improve it. Uh, like we have a long way to go. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I would agree with Agus that, you know, the, there is a joke that when the startups are going to the VC firms and asking for funding, they, they claim that they're going to use deep learning to solve the problem. When they post a job ad, they are looking for people with machine learning abilities. And when the work is actually done, it's basically they're using regression, right? So it's, there's a claim and a hype but I would also add to the point I was made that you also, you don't just have to watch out for the snake oil salesman outside the firm, but also within the firm, right? Like, I mean, that's one of the questions uh, of efficacy, right? Why is machine learning going to solve something that is not going to be done with any other means? I mean, do you really have to use machine learning to solve this problem? That's a question that needs to be asked for every project, everything, because everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon and start using machine learning, but is it really providing a lift uh, so that's one issue. I think the other challenge uh, would say that is there is, a, you know, coming back to the point I made earlier about non-financial risk. I think you know, the model risk management, um, you know, personnel, both, you know, across first and second lines and third lines, we have been focused on, you know, things that um, have become more familiar, like, you know, effective challenge, conceptual soundness. But now the, 
the concerns are more on data privacy, bias, explainability, other topics, which you know, some people are still grappling with and sort of trying to figure out whether it is within the domain of model, model risk or do we need to get compliance involved, do we need to get legal involved. So it's, it's uh, requiring a multidisciplinary approach, whereas earlier model risk management was more uh, sort of streamlined and you know, one dimension. I, I, I would like to make a call of action even for the technical people. If we apply black box, gradient boosting machine, actually boost because that's easy to do. And then you apply SHAP and suddenly you call it your model becoming trustworthy. I think the technical people, the people that work on this, we have a consciousness. That's not, that's not the right thing. Yeah. And the industry decide to ignore it. They want to move with all the enthusiasm to apply machine learning with all those uh, complex algorithms uh, looking for easy solution. That's what I'm worried about. And I think as we apply this more widely to replace the decision-making by machine, do we want to do something like that? So I would like to make a call even for the call for action for the technical community. As we talk about explainable AI, explainable machine learning, Let's not fool ourselves to call some uh, auxiliary add-on tool that you put in your AI, in your machine learning. And now suddenly you call it as trustworthy and responsible AI. And Jacob mentioned something earlier about overfitting, which is just focusing too heavily on certain characteristics. And a black box model, you're not really sure what it really heavily relied on. Did it really focus on the wrong aspect of what you're trying to get at? Was it focusing more on a demographic piece of data, something around maybe race, age, choice of anything, as opposed to more of your financial status? So when you're throwing a lot of data at a model to build it, you have to focus on the right pieces of that data to really get to the right decision. A black box model could really be just going down the wrong path. You might think yep. you're making the right decision, but then over time, as you start to gather statistics on who you actually predicted as risk and who you didn't, how did you do that? Why did you do that? A lot of ethics start getting involved because you might be heading right. down the wrong yeah. path and deciding based off the wrong characteristics on something. So I think this is where the goose the has focus... said in a... So go ahead, Jacob. Oh, I'll just say as a goose has said in, in previous forums, what we need is interpretability and not explainability. Um, I 100% agree with everything that Goose has said. I think there's a lot of risk we're seeing here, and there are a lot of snake oil out there. And there's, you know, when you'll see groups that do a, a benchmark of regression models for consumer underwriting for, you know, more advanced machine learning models, and you're not seeing a lift. And then you see some vendors that are pitching there's a lift. And as you dive in deeper, there isn't. And you challenge their numbers, and it falls apart. And or you see these vendors that say, I can do all these things, but you check if you're if the leadership or those that are buying the models don't know how they ask the right questions, don't know how to challenge and don't say, wait a minute, I don't collect that data. You know, the, the famous example I think a goose has pointed to is in cybersecurity, where a vendor will say, oh, we can compare the customer's phone call versus the, the normal voice that they have. We can compare, you know, if they're using a prepaid versus subscription we, compared to what they usually have. We can compare if they're using an Apple or an Android versus what they usually have. And the bank says, great, great, great. And a year later, the bank says, oh, I don't actually save any of that data. So the whole premise of the model, like saying customer authentication, that, oh, does this caller match our customer based on what we've saved? That doesn't even match because you haven't saved it. And so I think there's so many cases where you really need this call to action from the model developers, or, or more importantly, even those that are buying vendor models or vendor solutions, is to really critically ask, they're trying to sell me something. They're trying to make a profit. They're really pitching something. I, I need to, to challenge this. Whether you bring in model risk experts, or you hire model risk experts, or you bring in others, that there you really need to have this healthy skepticism uh, in this space. To, to yeah, so I think, been yeah and, I, and I think that sort of everything you're touching, it's also what we are seeing in our survey results. So, and it's really about the retention and the hiring of the right talent. And we're seeing mm -hmm. that 
a lot of the firms that we survey have said that this is one of the most impactful things. Although explainability and the supervisory consent rank higher, this is really impactful for firms. You have so to have me... that right talent that understands, you know, the hustles and skills, but also understands finance and also understands coding. And, and that's just not as available as maybe it should be. Because being yeah. able to challenge someone, you really need to have somebody in that, that can do that. Yeah, I want so to let me back. add to what, yeah, one quick thing on what yeah. Jacob was yeah. saying uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, like I think we are, we are agreeing that the focus should not be just on the models. The focus should be on the outcome. And then before we put any model, whether organically built or through a vendor, we should have the right system in place to be able to measure the efficacy of the model and you know what we call the proof of value and that needs to be a continuous process. So having said that, let me make one more argument to, to Jacob what you were saying around you know, the authentication and the fraud, given the fact that that's what I've been doing for the last 10 plus years. There is a lot of value uh, that I have seen with very, very specific and concrete results based on the data that you collect around the device biometrics, around the IP reputation, around the user behavior, and you, you take that data and this kind of goes into the value. Like I know we've been spending a lot of time here about challenges and concerns and where we need to, to do, but, but let's not forget that the things like that we can today, where anytime you access a website based on your device characteristics, I can do any anomaly detection based on the contextual data, based on the historical data of this bank and based on the network data across all the banks this concept was not possible five years ago without the innovation that we collectively have done in the MLAI space. Ashish, I think you're really segueing us to the next question, um, which is, which are the opportunities that AI, that AI presents to risk managers? And maybe Ashish, since you were already answering that yeah. question. No, I think the, the point, what I'm trying to say is that uh, look, first of all, we know, like, I know we've been discussing about that we need to be skeptical a little bit, we need to be cautious, but I, I want us at the same time to understand that what opportunity that we have in front of us, that ML and AI will become a utility, uh, like as, as right. simply how we see electricity and water in any computing that we do going forward. And we need to acknowledge that we are in the very, very early stages. I can tell you doing passive authentication and fraud for a number of years that the amount of efficacy that I can obtain today, the way I can do anomaly detection today, based on the fact that you are coming from a device with a screen resolution that does not exist and you know this you know, bot mitigation and human fraud, I would not have been possible to do any of that five years ago. So I feel like the opportunity, at least in certain areas, maybe not in all the areas, and this right. will, you know, eventually supply and demand will will eventually validate where we see. But there's a lot of traction in the cybersecurity, and there's a lot of value that I have seen in the cybersecurity around AI and ML. Yeah, some, I 100 percent Ashish. Oh, I was going to say I 100 percent agree with with the value that's coming out. I just think we, to your point, is that those that are buying it are uh, have enough experience and, and challenge and and um, and ability to call bluffs. And so I agree, this, the benefits of, of machine learning are tremendous. Cybersecurity, anti-money laundering, you know, uh, marketing, other areas, especially in the financial crime. But you just, and if nine out of 10 of the pitches are great, but you know, it's just that having that, you just don't get fooled. And so I, I think I'm agreeing with you. It's just, but making sure that the, you, the buyer can really, really challenge what's being sold. Cautiously sure, optimistic. But I was going to yeah. say that sometimes people think the purpose of AI is to replace people, but it's not. It's to get to a decision quicker. It's having yep. more data to be able to find an anomaly a lot faster than somebody else can when it comes to any type of risk, whether it's credit card purchase, money laundering, uh, fraud. It's being able to have enough information available to make that decision as fast as possible. And I think we're getting better at it. It's helping out companies save a lot of money. It's helping them avoid making bad decisions. 
it'll never be perfect, no matter how much data we can give it, how much data we can feed it, how many algorithms we can throw at it. But it's still going to be most likely a lot more accurate than a person can be. A person could probably spend a day looking at something and really come up with a good decision at the end. But do you really want to do one risk event per person per day, or do you want to be able to do multiple per minute, per second, on the fly? Um, Amit mentioned uh, about the cybersecurity. A person cannot really sit there waiting for a red light to go off, alerting them that something bad is happening. By the time that happens, it's probably already too late to assess the risk. You need to have something that can be real-time, live, listening, monitoring, and making those decisions as quickly as possible. So there's a lot of benefits to what we're doing today with AI, and it's growing. Um, as she's mentioned, we're still at the beginning of it, but it's getting better. Um, it's growing, it's evolving, compute's getting cheaper, data storage is getting cheaper, access to more data is becoming available. Everything is starting to line up. It took a while to get to where we are today, but we're at a good point where we just need to keep evolving and not settle. I think the key is to not settle and say, we're happy today. Goose mentioned the same thing, right? A lot of snake oil, there's too many. Every day I hear about a new company selling AI and I've never heard of it yesterday and today I know a new one and another one, and another one, and another one. It's just ensuring we're evolving in the right way, in the right path. And I think we're heading there. I want to bring in a different dimension also and that answers a question Natalie you had earlier. I think in terms of what are the opportunities for risk managers, right? Uh, you were asking earlier about the concern um, in the survey about regulation and why it is not there right now. I think that's an opportunity also in terms of risk margins can institute uh, what Agus was also mentioning earlier, self-governance, right? We can get ahead of the regulation. We don't need another SR 11.7 kind of thing tailored for AI. Uh, I think the industry practitioners can work together to come up with a proposal and a framework which gets ahead of the regulators. That's another, I would say, um, you know, opportunity for risk management. Given this is the 10 year anniversary of SR 11.7, this is the right time to think of how, you know, the risk managers evolve themselves without the regulators forcing them to. Thanks, Amit. I, I would, you have yeah, I, I, I would probably uh, uh, put it uh, probably somewhat uh, uh, in context with the uh, other others as well, talking about, the uh, the uh, the scale that people have to deal today in terms of the amount of information that we have to deal with, the speed of information and decision making that people have to do, and the quality of the decision making that people have to do because of the demand of our customer. So given the uh, given the scale, the speed, and the quality, so I think moving to the uh, moving having the. Uh, a software infused with AI is the right things to do to help or, or to, uh, to, 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 to aid the decision making that's uh, done by, by risk manager. Now, on the AI specific itself, because we're dealing with the so, uh, AI infused software with the AI itself, if we look at it, are really a, a, a couple of things that's in there, the power, right? The power of the feature engineering. Can we can do feature engineering dealing with large, uh, richer information, higher dimensionality, larger data, la bigger information. I think there is no doubt. That's the uh, that's a humongous uh, value add that machine learning and AI can do on the sophisticated feature engineering. Um, and then on the uh, on the uh, on the algorithm itself, the sophistication of the algorithm that people can do, uh, uh, that's that's also a lot of value in that to deal with things that I talk about the uh, the scale, the speed, and the uh, the quality. And I think that's a great segue, and I again to our next and final question. Um, so which regulatory developments around risk management and AI do you expect in the next five years? And if thinking about five years is too hard to think about in the next 18 months or so. Um, data privacy today? came up as an issue. I think more data than we want about us is being captured and stored. I know with regulations like GDPR, CCPA, and seems like every state today is, at least every big state, is trying to come up with some new regulation on the data privacy. 
what can we store? What can we use? How can we capture it? I think that's going to be the biggest issue in the next five years. Essentially, it's the models that we're building today. I think right now there's a lot more freedom than we're probably going to have in the next few years about data privacy. So I think things are going to still have to change. We're going to have to keep our eyes and ears open to how things are evolving and how to tweak and make the right changes so that we're not degrading our models and our predictive capabilities, but taking advantage of some of the uh, new regulations coming down the line. Yeah, I think EU kind of recently, maybe a few months ago, I think they they uh, proposed some guidelines. Uh, and I think the it was like 6% of the fines uh, on the company's annual. And, and that fine, if you think about, if you compare that to GDPR, Victor, the way you mentioned, I think GDPR was about 4%. So you can see that there is concern around the regulatory bodies of what AI can potentially do if not managed properly. Uh, uh, and NCC, a lot of you know, bodies, both in US and EU, trying to, to kind of get their arms around it. The challenge is we still do not completely know what an AI is. Like AI is still evolving, both for the people who are implementing it and for the people who are trying to regulate it. At a high level, I feel like there were like three work streams. One of them was the uh, impact assessment for the AI, which I think we mentioned earlier in the call. Uh, the second work stream around regulations is around accountability and independence so that the people who are developing it and the people who are evaluating it are, are decoupled so that there is no malpractice. And the third one, which we have been saying, which is this continuous review of the AI systems. Uh, it is not uh, you know, the car testing use case that Jacob, you, know, you mentioned, the car not present. Like we have to continue to change because right. the behavior is gonna continue to change. We are not a static society and hence we need to continue to evolve the new tagging, the new labeling, and the new reviewal systems. Yeah, I would say, I mean, the three areas uh, would be, I mean, data privacy is one of them. I, I would expect that there is going to be some kind of, you know, when you mentioned, Ashish mentioned EU, I expect, you know, something to come out in the US also you know, on this, because, you know, there's a lot of concern about how do we use data, how do we manage data, both upstream and downstream especially where retail data is concerned, people's you know, individual data. The second, I would say, you know, thing that is, and it's more for the industry is, and risk managers in particular, I mean, how do you sort of evolve from like looking at models technically to looking at, you know, being a multi-dimensional risk manager, looking at all facets, not just the technical aspects, because you're looking at compliance, privacy, uh, all other aspects, which um, has not been the traditional focus in the past. And the third point is more about, you know, workflow execution. You know, I mean, the, the, the track record of ML models getting executed is still very low within the industry. And how do you improve that? I mean, how do you prove, you know, coming back to the impact, how do you prove that this works and how do you get it streamlined? I, uh, I, I, I would look at it probably on, on three areas as well. The, uh, the, the input, the process and the output. So I keep it simple here on the input, of course, the data, right? So the uh, data collection abuse, that's a lot of that happening out there, right? Data collection abuse and data usage abuse uh, to build models. So the data piece, it will be, uh, it has to have something in there. And then the, the processing side, the algorithm that people employ because algorithm can amplify problems be it past problem or other problems. So on the algorithm itself, uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, we talk about transparency, explainability will be part of that on the algorithm itself. And then on the output, it's the use of the output. How are we going to use it? And uh, so also to pre prevent of misuse because we have a lot of misuse out there. So I would, I would look at it from the data, the input, so there is no abuse in that side. Algorithm, uh, make sure that we're using a safe and understandable algorithm. We know how to deal with the fail safe uh, uh, on the algorithm side and then on the uh, uh, abuse on the usage. Jacob? I, I'd agree with, with, with what everyone's been saying. I think on the use is something, unfortunately, we've been seeing a lot of issues that models are applied to areas where the population was not included in the training data set. You know, your models are built on the Southeast US so they're applied to national footprints. 
your auto lending is built for uh, four wheel cars and it's being used for motorcycle lending. You know, your, your, your home is, uh, your, your training data set didn't any, include any Native American reservations and you're using the model for lending on Native American reservations. You know, it, there's just so many examples that when you dive into the training data set that populations were, were not well represented. You know, facial recognition uh, training data sets that underrepresented individuals with darker skin. You know, you just see so many models in the industry that the training data set does not match the reality of the users. And then it, there's a high potential that it doesn't perform well in those, I want to call them edge cases, in those cases like motorcycle lending for sedan, uh, for, for auto lending when there were no motorcycle loans at all in the training data sets, right? Or, you know, using your credit card lending for Canadian citizens who are buying second homes in Florida and you have no Canadians in your training data set. And you're like, oh, well, I'm just going to apply it to them. What are you talking about? They have 30 years of great credit history in Toronto. You're just going to ignore that? And so, you know, you just, you just have to step back and say, time after time, you have to say, what is in your training data set? If there's no Canadians in your training data set and you're going to lend to them for their second homes in Florida, that might not work. Uh, and so obviously there's millions of these examples, but I, I think it's important to, especially to a goose's point, is really understanding the use and misuse, and some of the misuse is nefarious, but some is accidental, just you know, constantly forgetting Canadians uh, with U.S. banks uh, lending in South Florida. And, and so I don't think there's purpose discrimination against Canadians, but they, they, that's a chronic problem for lending, for example. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jacob. And I think we've actually reached the time. Um, I think we had a really rich discussion um, and really interesting, and I, obviously we could go on uh, since we have already reach the time that we had for the panel today. Yes, thank you so much. This has been amazing. And I know, yes, we could definitely go on and keep talking. This has been so interesting. Um, and I know this virtual audience has really enjoyed it. So thank you all. And a special thank you to Natalia for moderating and keeping us on track. A big virtual round of applause to all of you for sharing with us today. For the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and take some time to check out our amazing exhibits. Thanks so much and we'll see you around.